Okay, let's get into this. Susan, you first. Oh, yeah. me. <laughs> Do hate laws have any value? Yeah, I, I am, first of all, want, want to say that uh, how appreciative I am that Penn has uh, given me this opportunity to speak because I'm not a free speech absolutist, as many of you know. And uh, so I, I, I feel like Penn is putting, walking the talk by having me, shall we say, up here. And the answer to your question, Stephen, is yes, I do. Um, and that's because my project uh, as a feminist it has, and as a radical and as a progressive is because my project is to create a world and to make sure and promote a society in which every single person, no matter their gender, their sexuality, uh, or their ethnic group, will actually be living in such a way that they can take advantage of the much vaunted value of free speech. So in other words, I don't think that an absolutist idea that free speech is all we need and we'll all be fine is enough, that we have to work to create an environment where people can actually speak freely, be in an environment where people can uh, feel like uh, safe enough to speak, where they won't be silenced, and uh, where they can step up and, no and as I said, speak out. <clears throat> and I think that often hate speech, when it's narrowly defined, and we can hone that idea soon, but when hate speech laws are applied properly, that that's exactly what they do. That they help and advocate and give people the right to speak out uh, in uh, either court or in commission hearings to talk about uh, you know, their experience and what's valuable to them. So okay, yes. So I'm going to stop you there because we're just going to sort of set the that's table it. here and then we'll come back and you know, pursue these themes a little more deeply. Richard, why don't you go second? Do hate laws have any value? Uh, yes. Such as? Well, I mean, I think there are, um, you know, I'll answer that question and maybe a slightly different one at the same time. I mean, one of the challenges with the hate speech law, I think, stems from the fact that there are a variety of different harms that are, um, that, that lie behind these laws. Sometimes the focus is on the really direct impact on the members of what we might call a target group of some sort. That's the speech that's directed at that group, can be understood as threatening, intimidating, insulting, something along those lines. Other times when we talk about hate speech laws, and I think there's a place for a law to deal with that. There's a question of exactly what we're speaking of, but uh, sometimes we're talking, though, when we talk about the harm of hate speech, something a little different, and that is the concern that, that uh, hateful speech can, directed at members, not of the target group itself, but it's meant to sort of encourage and still um, racist attitudes, encourage violent action, or something along those lines. So um, I think there's a place for hate speech laws to respond to both of those sorts of harms. The challenge, of course, is to try to define exactly what speech we want to restrict. And of course, I agree, we're trying to define a fairly narrow category of uh, speech we would understand as extreme in character. And the challenge, of course, is that racism, homophobia, they're systemic problems. We have stereotypes, more subtle forms of speech that is um, you know, bigoted, prejudiced in character. We have more extreme forms. And so one of the challenges to, is to actually try to draw a line that distinguishes what we think we should be restricting from what we accept um, is I don't want to say inevitable part of discourse, but is something that is there, is commonplace, and needs to be responded to because it, in fact, is so widespread. And we'll try and do that throughout the course of the evening. Yeah. Okay, Janet, you're up on this one. Hate laws, do we need them? Not much, I would, I would say. Uh, I think things are shaping up here that I'm probably the hardest line <laughs> on the free expression line. Um, these be criminal code stuff where there's actual advocacy of violence or advocacy of genocide. Let, you know, I'm, I'm pretty... I'm pretty content with that. I have, I have very close civil libertarian friends who are not, and they would make sort of parallel arguments to what I would say about the human rights laws to criminal code, but I'm not, we're not gonna probably go there tonight. But what I wanna say, that I guess the root, I've been trying to figure this out the last few days, the root concern I have about what are called the hate or offensive speech provisions in our human rights codes is that, number one, I don't see that they actually, for the years that we've had them, have done much good. And I find that largely the people who are very sympathetic to them and, and in favor of them don't pay much attention to the harm 
that they do, and they do do harm, they do suppress um, discussion and exchange of ideas. And what also worries me a lot is that people seem to think if we don't have laws aimed at this kind of nasty speech, there's nothing else for us to do. That there's been a sort of growing passivity, turn it over to the state, and if there's no law for the state to enforce, there's no solution to the problem. Whereas, I, I mean, that's preposterous. I mean, we're, you know, it's a democracy. We're supposed to be engaged citizens. There's a ton of things we can do. We don't need to run to the Human Rights Commission to file a complaint. Ronaldo, where are you on this? Um, definitely um, in support of restrictions on hate speech. Um, I think unlike um, my colleague who just spoke, the question that we're in a democracy doesn't really speak to the fact that because we're in a democracy, not all of us experience that democracy equally. Not all of us have the same access to the institutions of that democracy in the same fashion. So the question of hate speech is a question of, of historical relationship to the ways in which language wounds, um, to the ways in which language can be injurious, to the ways in which incitement through speech can lead to um, forms of physical violence. And I think that for people who come from histories where language has been um, both deployed at them as a way to dehumanize them, and language has been also deployed at them in a range of kinds of physical harms and injuries that in the contemporary moment, hate speech laws do carry some important recognition of the history of how we arrived at the law in the first instance. Jen, you want to go back on that? Yeah, I do. Um, th there can't be a conscious woman alive, um, and certainly not in this room, who doesn't understand the harm that language can do. Um, I mean, if, if uh, you just can't. I mean, I mean, I mean, misogyny, uh, uh, not unthinking uh, assumptions about women being in, not fully capable, et cetera, are everywhere out there. But I would ask you, where would the women's movement have been without generous protection for free speech? Where are you talking about, I, are you I, talking I, about I, us <laughs> making generalizations about men? Or about women. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm curious as to what, where would we be without protection? No, I, 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 I guess what I'm I trying, didn't I'm think trying there was to any see. Exception to the little bit of generalization about men. I'm not sure that we. Or well, about women, well, not, not, stand, not, not. Stand by. Let's let Janet finish her thought. All, all I meant was this. Mm -hmm. All I meant was this, is, and I do try to focus upon the institution of free speech, and the role it has played through history, in giving voice to people who are downtrodden. And what I meant by where would women be had there not been protections for free speech, it is how did we voice our need to have the vote? How did we voice our need for uh, access to abortion? How do we voice our concerns about the fact that the laws that are supposed to protect us from pregnancy discrimination don't actually protect us very well? That the laws against sexual assault don't, we have to be able to do this. We have to be able. So I think it's a short-sighted and kind of unimaginative way of thinking about uh, the importance of expression. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, hate speech laws don't necessarily um, you know, stifle that kind of response. I mean, if you look at what the laws have actually done, we're talking about fairly extreme expression. If you think about the United States, the debate, I mean, the cases in which many of us here in Canada would take issue with are cases about a burning cross planted on the front lawn of the first black family to move into a previously all-white neighborhood or a neo-Nazi march in a, a Chicago suburb with the largest number of Holocaust survivors residing there. I mean, we're talking about pretty extreme stuff in character that I'm quite happy to understand as threatening in character. Maybe it's not a threat that most of us realize could be carried out, although I think if you're a member of those groups, you, you might not feel enormous confidence about it, but uh, you know, I, I think that that is sometimes what we're speaking of. And what I think is that we, we're inclined to trust decision makers and those people who apply the laws too much when we assume that they're gonna apply them in those circumstances and not apply them in the cases where we don't want the, we good thinking, well-intentioned folk, don't want the voice suppressed. I, I think that